Yeah, so as you said, uh, my name is Brian. I'm with the Edmonton Transit, and I've been pretty much a part of this uh, project since the beginning. So starting here, the, we're going to start out with some quick background of Edmonton and what we're trying to accomplish. Then go through the first step, which was the transit strategy. And then we made two draft networks, the first draft network, and then the second one was the finalized network. And then the alternate transit service, we've, uh, we're looking at to fill in some holes and then go over some key learnings. So some background to start out with. So Edmonton is currently just under a million people, but we're currently planning to grow about twice that in the next 30 to 50 years. Uh, we're diagonally bisected by uh, the North Saskatchewan River that only has a handful of bridges going across, which does kind of limit our ability to connect the two sides. Uh, the, uh, the way our urban form is, I like to use the analogy of a tree, like the growth rings on a tree, with the first few, uh, like the inner areas being a grid pattern with some density, and then as it with each concentric ring after that being a little more curvilinear than the previous. Uh, it ends up with uh, like a donut shaped uh, density with the a dense core and then some density in the outer areas, but and then a donut shaped area of relatively low density. So our current bus network is a time transfer system. It has about 220 routes. We use 26 transfer cent transit centers and we have two LRT lines. Um, so as the the overall, pro, uh, the overall uh, intent we're trying to get out of this is to grow ridership, uh, both the absolute amount of ridership and the mode shift. Uh, it's been 20 years since we've done this last time. The population's gone up by more than 20, more than 50 percent, and we've had a lot of uh, changes in development, uh, especially in the outer areas where we see a lot more develop, a lot more density than we used to. Also, been a lot of changes in uh, customer expectations due to demographic shifts, due to just changes in how people live their lives and, and of course, technology. The time transfer system is no longer working as well as it used to, uh, simply because our city has gotten too big and too complicated. With uh, 200 routes and 26 transit centers, it's, it becomes very difficult for uh, the time transfer system to work as well. So we end up with uh, missed transfers and some other just general problems with it. So we're looking at moving to a frequency-based system that will lay the foundation as we move to a city of about 2 million people over the next 20, 30 to 50 years, I think. So the first step we did was the transit strategy. This was, uh, it had three parts of it really. We had the community knowledge we're trying to tap through public engagement. Then of course we're adding to that some technical expertise through some reports we did on the industry scan and other, other cities, what they're going through as well as uh, market segmentation of our own, um, own riders. And then, of course, going through the uh, council's leadership through motions that they've made, discussions that they've had on previous, uh, previous transit-related topics, and then policy reviews. So the public engagement aspect turned out to be, especially for this per first part, uh, quite large. It was, uh, it was kind of a shift in how we had worked things, so where we used a lot more public, we used public engagement a lot more than we had in previous uh, iterations. And, and so in order to do this, we had to make sure we cast as wide a net as we could, uh, making sure as many people knew about it as, as possible. Doing this uh, required us to engage in ways that we had never done before and to go out of our way to target groups that had traditionally not been involved or had faced barriers. So we did this in a number of ways. Uh, one way was to use the, uh, we called it the engagement bus. And you can see the blue bus here in the corner that actually ran on regular routes and just picked up people uh, gave them a free ride in exchange for them letting us know what they thought. Uh, that bus was also at a lot of events, and so we had teams at a lot of various festivals and events throughout the city uh, to get people to pretty much go to where they were instead of forcing them to come to where we were. Uh, obviously, in addition to that, we still had various workshops, but instead of having them be downtown or in locations that were convenient for us, they were scattered throughout the city so we could get people who lived in those areas and a lot more of them were targeted. And then of course we used uh, both paper and online surveys. So the, the project had four clear phases. The first phase was just to get awareness out there and that one was relatively short phase. The second one was uh, had two kind of subparts. The to gather ideas we had, as you can see there, we went through uh, 21 events we were at on a number of bus routes and had 11 workshops with 6,000 plus people there. This was mostly just to get the kind of pie in the sky ideas about what people wanted and what people didn't want, what they didn't like, but just kind of no, uh, no limitations, just taking notes and gathering it. Then the second phase was to prioritize these, uh, to kind of refine all these ideas down to which ones were the most important. And this one was a little smaller, but we still ran on uh, quite a few bus routes and workshops and had over 3,000 people show up. 
The third phase was one of the more challenging ones because as would be expected, we quickly realized we can't do everything that everybody wants. So instead of us trying to figure out what, what uh, trade-offs need to be made, we actually asked the public to help us figure out. And so of course, in order to do this, we had yet another round of, uh, of engagement, of uh, workshops, went on bus routes, and we actually ended up with almost 13,000 people participating in this. Uh, and then after, at the end of that, the last stage was mostly to take all this together and to turn it into a, uh, an actual technical document that could be brought to city council and shared with the public. So what we heard, uh, the values we heard was that people wanted, uh, that they valued mobility, connectivity, integration, and sustainability, and that they wanted their transit network to have, to be fast, safe, convenient, and reliable. And these simple sounding ideas have, have formed the, the, the background of, of everything else we've done since, and these appear in business reports and a bunch of other things we do to kind of emphasize what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, so the trade-offs were a little less uh, clear-cut. There was a couple items that were there was lots of consensus on. There was uh, support, of course, for uh, demand based on uh, service based on demand, which means that if if no one's using it, they don't get service very much. And if there's lots of people, they would get uh, service that would meet what they're what they need. We also had the vast majority of uh, Edmontonians said they supported us, that they either they were okay with the the investment that was being made, and a lot of them actually thought that we should increase the investment. Uh, however, there was a lot of other issues that were less clear cut, where technically there was a majority, but there was really no clear consensus. And uh, issues of this are whether it, the transit service is for as many people as possible or those who need it the most, uh, whether we should have, uh, whether the, the, the routes should go as close to people's houses or whether they should be a little further away but have higher frequency, whether the, uh, or to the, the amount to which the cars and the buses had priority over one another on the roads, and then, of course, the willingness to transfer. Uh, one thing we did find, though, when we started looking at it was that there was a clear breakdown based on where people live. With the uh, communities near the uh, core of this, uh, the downtown and the university areas in the center, tending to want to have uh, service in all times of day and night and to use it for a lot more different types of uses. So they were fine with high, they wanted the frequency, they didn't mind walking and they didn't mind transferring, they just wanted it to run when they needed it. Uh, outer areas were a little more sensitive to walking distances, although this is largely because of the uh, the network itself being a little more sparse out there and the the roads tending to be, or the, the design tending to be a little less uh, pedestrian friendly. Uh, we, but their, their focus was generally getting uh, downtown as quickly as they could, especially during the peak periods uh, through uh, express or through uh, single seat uh, bus trips. There was, some split between whether they wanted whether they were willing to transfer or not. So we took this uh, down and we, we find it down and made some basic principles on how we were going to build the system moving forward. The uh, so of course we're going to move away from the pulse and the time transfers and move instead to a frequency based system. The level of service will be based on demand. Uh, we're trying to actually make fewer routes uh, with less overlap. Uh, this will simplify the network and make it a lot easier for people to understand where they're, or which routes they need to catch to go where. We're also trying to move those routes off of some of the uh, circuitous uh, local streets and onto the more uh, direct, more linear roads that tend to be a bit bigger, although in a lot of cases this meant people would have to walk a bit further to get to those. We also moved to uh, a system of a hierarchy of specialized routes instead of a large number of overlapping general purpose routes. And then, of course, different service patterns in the different areas to reflect uh, the different needs. So we took these principles and we uh, used them to make an initial network. Uh, this was We always knew that this would just be a draft. This was just a starting point to have a good conversation with the public. Uh, we knew going in that we were going to try to use the same resources and approximately the same coverage area. So we're not trying to expand anything. We're not cutting budgets. We're not getting more money. Uh, and But we just took the feedback we had heard along with uh, current ridership, land use information, identified a number of uh, lo important locations like hospitals and malls, and then looked at, of course, at the existing roads, but also some changes that were planned uh, in both the roads and uh, urban form that were planned for the future. So we, uh, we developed this draft network, which we brought to the public. And on the map we have here, the, the routes, the different types of routes are coded in different colors to help people understand what the purpose of the route was. Uh, we'll go over each one of these here in a second, but in general, it's a fundamentally different network than what we have now. It had about half the number of routes, 
And there was two main components that kind of worked together. The first one is the primary transit network or PTN, which uh, is made up of your higher order transit types of transit, you know, trains and uh, frequent routes, rapid and crosstown. And then on top of that was your local routes that connected everything else. Uh, so going into more detail with the, the PTN, the main or the biggest, the highest order component of it is the LRT, which is shown on this map as the dotted black lines. There's only a couple of these and they're only along the biggest corridors. Then you end up with the red lines that are the frequent routes. These mostly go through the, the middle of the city and they're, they're high frequency, they run at all times of day and night, and they're meant to make it easy to transfer between them and from other route types to them. Then we have the cross towns, which are the purplish lines that are kind of make a ring around the, the periphery essentially, and these are meant to connect various areas of the periphery without having to go downtown. And then the rapid routes or express routes, and we have the two different types there. The green ones uh, run uh, most time periods, and then the orange ones run only during the peak and these are of course meant to get people downtown or at least to the uh, to the FTNs as fast as possible. So on top of this we end up with the local routes and these are meant to provide coverage because obviously the other ones don't go everywhere. Uh, that's They're a little less direct although we tried to make them as direct as possible because they do go through the individual neighborhoods so sometimes they do have to run on less direct roads but in general they're meant to just connect neighborhoods to nearby neighborhoods and then connect them to uh, transfer points such as transit centers. So they're not really meant to get across town. If you wanna go across town, you have to transfer to the, uh, to the primary transfer ne transportation network, uh, which is of course meant for the, the longer trips. These ones, so as the other, uh, the other types of routes on the PTN, those are meant to provide a certain type of service. So the schedules are based around the type of service it's trying to provide with some adjustments for how busy they are. The local routes are more based on how people use them. So the most of them are, just like the other ones, are much more uh, frequent in the peaks, and a lot of them only run in the peaks, and a lot of them kind of scale back quite a bit or only run in a handful of time periods. So uh, we took this to the public. We had 24 workshops scattered throughout the city. We had uh, 10 coffee chats, which were uh, kind of informal, uh, discussions with either specific groups or specific neighborhood groups. And then we had six targeted workshops uh, as well. And as you can see, we had over 2,300 people show up, over 4,200 surveys done. One of the aspects of this that was absolutely critical was the remix maps, the, interna the interactive maps. These were useful at everything we did pretty much from workshops, presentations. And we also shared them on the city's website and was actually used in the, the surveys. This is a really handy tool because it did allow us to do, well, it allowed it for everybody to use it very, very easily figure out how their individual route would be affected, which stops were likely to be used. And it kind of showed roughly what the schedules were likely to be. However, there were two kind of glitches with this that we found somewhat frustrating. The, the built-in send feedback button was, while it was really useful and really easy to use, the problem was is it effectively discouraged people from actually taking the survey. And then the, the Jane or their travel time feature, the issue we had there is that a lot of people, they knew what their current trip took, they knew how long it took, and then they would use the built-in Jane feature and drop it in there. And because uh, it uses uh, approximate schedules and approximate transfer times and a couple of the round off things, it actually a lot of times showed or made it look like the travel time would be a lot further. And that's just because they're kind of comparing apples to oranges, but they didn't realize that. So it did cause a lot of uh, confusion. Um, so in addition to the external engagement, we also did internal engagement. We went to all five of our transit garages. We had a number of presentations to both operators and inspectors, as well as other groups within the Edmonton and within the city. We, uh, we ended up, what we found is that most of the operators, while they had lots of really valuable information, their, their focus was more on, they wanted to have a conversation. And so we ended up with 17 pop-up sessions where we would have a conversation with uh, the various operators at different, and we did them at different times at different garages to get as good a cross section as we could. And they provided a lot of really valuable feedback, but they were really only willing to do so in a face-to-face -face manner. They didn't really want to do the surveys. So what we heard from the public, we heard that there was some big concerns about walking distances, uh, particularly for people with mobility issues or when there's bad weather. There was a, there's a handful of places where the, the network we had had built 
proposed taking fixed route service out of the neighborhood entirely, or at least making the walking distance quite substantial. And uh, this, those small areas became quite upset or quite, or quite concerned, I guess, and actually showed up at quite a few of our engagement uh, events. Then of course, there was the, the concern about transfers. The, uh, the biggest concern here, I think, was due to the, the current time transfer system having some problems due to construction and schedule reliability issues. And so a lot of people were, were quite apprehensive about transferring because they were afraid that there would be, that it would be worse than it's going to be. Uh, in addition to transit operators, they, they, they of course reiterated these same concerns, but they also had a lot more helpful, uh, more technical, more specific uh, information for us. They helped us identify a couple of locations that we hadn't realized were that important. They brought up some operational concerns about turns or about speed limit changes or about locations that there was something we just weren't aware of. They also had a lot of concern about how to educate both the operators and the public to make this the rollout and the transition be relatively smooth. So we took all this that we had heard and we made the next revision network. Uh, in this, technically we only changed about 20% of the routes, but the, a lot of the uh, changes were focused in specific areas and a lot of these routes actually went through numerous areas. So it was actually more substantial than that makes it sound. The way we uh, did this was to look at pretty much at every level, again, we, we went back and looked at it from individual stops and individual routes to regions of the city, and then the entire network on the whole to look at what worked and what didn't. We made the changes based on what we heard from the feedback. We also did some uh, walking distance analysis and then some operational assessments, which have been going on ever since really. But in every case, in every case we still stuck to the transit strategy principles. So the walking distance analysis, there's a, a, one of the example maps we have here where any areas that are shown in white means that the, the walking distance either stays the same uh, or in some cases it improves. But for this one, we're mostly just looking at where the walking distances would increase. So with each one of these spots, we, it gave, we, we looked and we drilled down deeper to see what, the, uh, what was there and see if this is a problem or see how concerned we needed to be about this. In a lot of cases, the worst areas were in the middle of a field or in a ravine or something like that. But in some cases, these were in the middle of a neighborhood that, and so we had to take a close look at and make some decisions about what needed to happen here. Uh, some examples of what happened or of changes we made. So with Capuano area, this is in the uh, southeast side of the city. We knew going in that there would be some concerns about the, the, the changes in the network because these areas, uh, some areas would have to now backtrack to get downtown, but we weren't sure just exactly how severe this was gonna be and how, how, how willing people were to, to do this. And what we came back with is it turned out that this was actually quite important to a lot of people and it needed to be resolved. They also pointed out that the north-south connection between the Capuano area here and the Bonnie Dune, which is shown as a, on the bottom there, we, we knew that it was somewhat important, but we didn't realize just how important it was. And so they brought that to our attention. So as we came back, we, we uh, actually split one of our high frequency routes. We split it in half so that it provided the connections that people needed in the Capilano area to downtown. And then we uh, were able to divert one of our local routes to provide that north-south connection. Another area is on the other side of town, on the uh, northwest side of town where we have uh, the Castle Downs area. So our initial thought was that we didn't think, we kind of undervalued what the Castle Downs, what was actually at the, the center hub there. We thought that most people really just wanted to go downtown or wanted to get to the university. And when we went out to the public, they told us that we were wrong, that that wasn't gonna cut it. And they also, there was also some other uh, issues with this one, the Crosstown, we were trying to kind of reduce the number of routes as much as we can. So we're trying to provide some local coverage with a Crosstown route. And then that area on the south there, we brought it pretty thin as we, uh, as we tried to reduce the number of routes there. And as we brought this to the public, they pointed out that this just wasn't gonna work. So I took their advice to heart and we essentially, we added a couple routes and then we totally rebuilt the whole network in the area so that the, the Castle Downs Community Hub is now the focus of that neighborhood. Uh, you can still get downtown with about the same travel time and it's just that the number of routes is uh, funneled a little differently so you can still get to other locations. We also added, uh, or we made some changes to the area south of, of uh, the 137th Avenue there which allowed us to improve the walking distance. And by adding a couple of local routes, we were able to make the uh, crosstown route, the purple one, more direct, which better fit with what it was supposed to do. So the overall impact of this 
these changes, what we did is we went back to the walking distances again. And what you're looking at here is changes between the first draft network and the second draft network. And so green means we did something to uh, reduce the walking distance and yellow and red means just the opposite. People have to walk further. And what we did here was that obviously whenever you make a change, some areas are gonna come out ahead and other ones aren't. But in a lot of cases, what we found was that uh, there was like a Y intersection where you, in order to go both, to do both halves, you had to have two routes. So in some cases we had chosen one, one side over the other based on either making the route more direct or trying to provide a connection that, that we thought was important. But then when we went out to the public, they pointed out that, that, that either the connection wasn't that important or in some cases we realized that the, in order to make the route more direct, we'd actually run like uh, on, the, on the right here, we'd actually run by uh, a field and some low density residential while making some people in some apartment complexes and senior centers walk further. And so it was pointed out that that wasn't the way to go and we made the change, which resulted in much better coverage for some parts. And then the area over there on the right is uh, the areas that are red and yellow. Those are areas that it's essentially a big field and then some very low density residential. So then we took this back out to the public did another 12 community workshops, 13 coffee chats, uh, three targeted neighborhood workshops, and uh, st as well as st stakeholder workshops. As you can see, we had 2,700 people show up and over 3,500 surveys. In general, what we found was that most of the changes were well received, although they did point out a few things that could have been done better or in a few other areas that maybe we had missed or hadn't quite valued as much. And we took a lot of that back and are still in in some cases, we're able to make finer tweak, final tweaks to it, and in some cases, just evaluated it and turned out that it didn't, it wasn't uh, going to work. So, continuing on, as part of the operational assessment, we essentially what we did is we looked at all the areas on the, the in the city, all the roads that we're going on that we or that we're planning to use that we don't use today, and this included turns onto roads that were turns we don't make, include road segments we don't make. And in some cases, there, there might have already been bus stops along these segments. So we had to look at those. And in a lot of cases, there weren't bus stops. And so we had to figure out what's going to happen here. And uh, sometimes we'd, need, we'd have to add a signal or look at uh, making a signal. And this, of course, was done using maps and a number of uh, site checks and other tests. Uh, in a couple of cases, it was relatively straightforward what had to happen. But there were a handful of places where we had to make a decision about either uh, changing a route or adding some expensive infrastructure and had to evaluate what the best way to do it was. So when we're, uh, so the next round we did, we looked at the, the frequencies. So we had done, initially done the frequencies based on uh, a combination of our own experience and what the equivalent or similar routes in the area were, just as a kind of a one-for-one -one comparison in a lot of cases. Uh, but we wanted to do a much more, a much more rigorous uh, look at it than that. So what we did uh, for the, the PTN networks, it was relatively straightforward to map those straight from a current route to the future routes, either one for one or relatively straightforward, you know, one to two or two to one kind of thing. The local network, however, was very much different from the what we currently have. So with those, we actually had to break each route down into parts as it went through every neighborhood and then map each segment of each one of the current routes onto an equivalent section in a future route and then use the ridership there to take a look at where, when we thought the demand would, or what, where we thought the demand would be to figure out what frequencies we needed to have. And this was another tool we used to verify and kind of fine tune the schedules. So, and another thing that we're working on still is uh, looking at the transfer location. So we're moving away from a time transfer network, but that doesn't mean that people aren't still going to transfer. We realize there still are locations where there's gonna be a large number of transfers in one direction or another. We've just done, uh, at the moment, we're, we're kind of manually going through these and figuring out, uh, initially we figured out just where the transfers are likely to take place and looked at the relative frequencies and uh, have done some other work with that. But as I said, this is still a very much a work in progress as we go through and finalize our schedules. So even with the uh, local routes and all this, we realize there still, still are a few gaps in the network. We've identified a number of places where the, uh, where just, the fixed route transit just did not seem to be the right tool for the job. Uh, the, generally these had some ge geographical constraint combined with a low population or some other factor that caused them to have very low ridership. And so we figured out the, the we had to identify these using specific criteria there, you know, 600 meters away from uh, fixed routes, 200 uh, occupied dwellings and a thousand population. Uh, 
but what we found is usually these were nearby. There were several of them in, in uh, close proximity, so we kind of combined them into clusters. And this map, what it shows is the, the ones in pinkish are the ones that they currently have fixed routes, but in the future network, they're either not going to have fixed routes or the walking distances are quite long. But we also identified a number of areas where we don't currently go there, but that uh, an alternative transit service might actually make sense to, to look at. And so those were identified here in the green. So what we did is for each one of these clusters, we, we, can, we uh, looked at three different alternative methods. We looked at an on-demand uh, method, a taxi, and a ride-hailing app. And then for each one of these, for each cluster, we looked at a combination of current demand and population to project what we thought the demand would likely be uh, for both peak and off-peak. And then we, we figured out what, the, what it would take to, to connect those areas to the nearest transit center and then compared that to what the fixed route, fixed route option would likely be. And of course, to, to do this fairly, we had to compare the, using the same number of passengers and also look at uh, capital investments and, and uh, as well as the operating costs. So in addition to doing the, the technical aspect and the estimating, we needed to take a close, we needed to investigate, we needed to, sorry, engage with the public. So last spring, we went out to the neighborhoods that were looking at losing uh, their fixed route service. And then last fall, we went out to the, some neighborhoods that were looking at uh, possibly gaining, uh, gaining service that don't have anything now. And at each one of these, we gave the participants information about all four of the options, the three on demand and then the fixed route option, and trying to gauge the, uh, their support and identify concerns with each one of these by a combination of, uh, of com you know, in-person in conversations and surveys filled out. So what we found out uh, was obviously the places who were looking at possibly losing their fixed route, they were a little uneasy about that and not particularly thrilled, uh, but they were glad to hear that we weren't just abandoning them. And a lot of times once they, once they showed up and they realized that we were looking at ways to serve them, they kind of openly admitted that, yeah, the bus routes going through there are pretty empty. Maybe you're right. Maybe buses aren't the right answer for the problem here. And so it was somewhat well received that we were at least out there. What we found is that, uh, of course, there was the greatest support for the fixed bus because that's what they knew. But there was also decent support for using an on-demand van system as long as it was operated or, or uh, contracted by ETS uh, so that they, they could feel that it was part of the ETS system and not some third party thing that, that they, they were just very apprehensive about using some uh, contracted service through some other provider. They were concerned it might be unsafe or just unreliable. So from all this, we've learned quite a bit. Uh, the, the first issue or the first thing we learned was that public engagement was invaluable. Uh, we we knew it would be we knew it would be very valuable, but it's been beyond anything we had expected. Uh, they helped us validate things that we we thought we knew, but they also pointed out to us when we're wrong, and they helped us in a lot of cases when we weren't 100% certain should we do this or should we do that. They helped us figure out what made the most sense. Uh, in addition to doing that and helping us point out things that were just invaluable to helping us gain uh, support both publicly and politically, uh, the uh, Along with this, it was critical to reach as many people as possible. The way we approached it, where we're actually going out to where people lived, worked really well. And there's a lot of places we never would have reached had we not done that. You know, we went to community centers and we went to uh, rec centers, and people who had never heard about it were just like, "Oh, what's this?" and came in and gave us really good feedback. Uh, on and kind of in line with that, even negative publicity is still good publicity because uh, it might people might come in upset about it or whatever, but at least they're aware that this is happening. And it actually, a lot of people showed up to these uh, our engagement events and they were concerned or upset and uh, they wanted to come and talk to us and then they gave us good feedback in some cases and a lot of cases they they just didn't quite understand what was happening and we were able to uh, talk to them and once they, they left actually feeling a lot better. So, uh, but on the downside of this is you're never going to reach everybody. Even though we've been doing this for more than six years and using every channel we have, there's still people who don't realize this is coming but we've got as many as we could. So one of the issues with this uh, is that it's a really complicated idea, both internally and externally. It's, hard, it's a complicated change and it's hard to boil down into a one sentence news headline or into a lot of times even to a one paragraph you know, blurb into something. So it was really easily misunderstood and misconstrued. Uh, the, in order to get around this, we had multiple phases of engagement at every step along the way. 
And the interactive map was also very useful to help us get around this problem. Uh, another challenge with this was just the sheer number of unrelated moving parts. In order to have the uh, engagement work, to have the comms parts work, to advertise, and to make it as many, to use as many channels as we did, we had a lot of different parts, both within the city, within Edmonton Transit, and external groups and, and uh, consultants that we had to work with. And we knew in order for us to be taken seriously and to have confidence, it had to be seamless which was, we, we managed to pull it off fairly well, but it was really a struggle in a lot of cases. Uh, some other challenges we ran into is you're, you're never gonna make everybody happy with this because obviously whenever you make a change, unless you're prepared to add a lot of resources, whenever you make these types of change, some places are gonna come out ahead and some places aren't. And some customers are, and likewise, some customers aren't gonna come out ahead. And this, this was difficult to communicate to some groups within the city who didn't realize that not everybody would come out ahead with this. Uh, and it did result in a, minor, a small minority of people who were really concerned actually kind of dominating the conversation at some steps. Uh, and then something else we've heard is that almost every other place that's gone through a similar type of redesign has found that there's a, just a universal problem of distrust and concerns about the walking distances, transfers, and of course losing service. Something else, uh, another aspect of what we've learned is about the operators. We, the, the first thing that came, we ran into with them is the huge concerns about what we were trying to do and why. They were worried that we were trying to cut budgets, that we were gonna be doing layoffs. And we had, until we could address this, we weren't really able to engage with them in a very effective way. But once we did engage with this, we found that they were actually very, very helpful and very, uh, very willing to work with us. And this is critical. They are the face to the public there and if they the operators don't feel comfortable with this it's not gonna it doesn't go over well uh, they knew that they would be constantly asked by people who had heard something on the news because they really are a face to the public and we need they need to be able to answer these questions and in order to do that we couldn't just tell them what we were doing we needed them to understand why and this is something that i think maybe we could have done a little better than than we did at least at some stages along the way uh, and of course, the operators need to be a part of the process. They're a huge story of knowledge and, and experience, and they were able to provide us with much more specific and, and technical information about things, able to tell us about turns and corridors and, and issues where you know, this type of bus isn't gonna work and that type of bus isn't gonna work. And because they're so much more familiar with it, you can actually have a, a, a much higher, much more technical conversation with them and have it not get totally lost. Uh, and, and most of them, at least once we gave them the chance to talk to us, they were very willing and interested in being involved. They just needed the chance. So other, some other factors that's critical to keep in mind is that this is gonna affect a lot of people's daily, daily routine. And along with that is that most people don't really care so much about the, the big picture, the design principles, they're more concerned about how it affects them directly. And so of course, when they come to you, this is what they're focused on They're They're concerned about how you're gonna affect them and you can't just say, well, yeah, you're losing service, but, but the principles, like they, that doesn't work very well. We, have to, we had to be a lot more uh, compassionate and we had to be a lot more understanding and, and had to listen to people and understand their perspective in order to get the feedback we needed. And then also in order for them to understand what we were really trying to do. Uh, in addition, from the perspective of the people using the system, every second from the, from the second they leave this, their door to the second they get where they're going, that whole trip is really part of their transit trip. And even though we don't really have control over a lot of it, from their perspective, it's still our problem and it's something we need to be doing something about if it doesn't work. And then the, the final factor to consider is that can never start too soon to do your operational assessments. There's, uh, we've done several iterations of it and every time we go through it, we find some other, usually minor things that we had missed or undervalued or misunderstood. And so it's one of those things, you just can't do this too much. Uh, so and in conclusion to this, it's been a long journey. We originally started the transit strategy in 2014, ran most of it was in 2015 and 16, did the, dra the draft bus network in 2018, and then have been finalizing it ever since. Uh, we're still not there yet though. We're, we still haven't hammered out the final schedules. Uh, the first last kilometer project, that's actually going to city council on February 25th, so in a week and a bit. And uh, obviously we haven't actually rolled this out yet. We're I think exactly 200 days away from it today. And we realized that when we first roll it out that it's not gonna be perfect on day one, that we're gonna, we're gonna have to make tweaks, we're gonna have to be making adjustments, but also that as time goes on that this isn't gonna be this way forever, there's gonna have to be future uh, revisions. It's probably gonna happen again in 10 or 20 years where we do another 
hard look at it to figure out what we need to do to make the system work for everybody. And so that brings me to the end, and I'm happy to take any questions that we have.